want to thank the Lord for this opportunity to share some thoughts with you. I'm speaking on the topic, Raising Godly Children to Possess the Nations. And I'll start with a quote by Stephen Chucks Nwakeke. And I quote, A man that has not dealt with his foundation cannot deal with another man's foundation, unquote. We live in an era where the fight for the capture of the minds and thoughts of children and the young ones have become the challenge of society. Today, children are exposed to all manner of ideas and issues on our televisions, our radios, video games, mobile phones, the social media, etc. Unfortunately, most parents and guardians pay less attention to some of these issues. Again, some of the issues are being pushed discreetly using the media landscape and others in the form of policies from national governments through our educational system. And recently, as you are aware already, the Comprehensive Sexuality Education came. And there was a hue and cry all over the place. The question I was asking myself was, it is good that we reacted. But why are we reacting? The fundamental issue is that for most of us, we were concerned about the foundation of our children. If our children were well grounded, we wouldn't have worried. But today it is comprehensive sexuality education. It's not going to end. Tomorrow it will be another thing. The next day is going to be another thing. So you realize that building the foundation of the children becomes very paramount. There's a gradual and subtle attempt to take away or minimize the role of parents or guardians in effectively raising their own children through the increasing rights systems. This new dispensation and its attendant challenges call for a new type of Christian child, one who is fully equipped and prepared for the times ahead, one who can discern the time we live in and know how to respond or what to do. Therefore, the topic raising godly children to possess the nation is very relevant and important for our time. In discussing this topic, there's a need to consider these four things. What is implied by raising godly children? Who is a godly child? What is their value to us? And where should they be raised? What do we mean by possessing nations when it comes to children? And how do the above three interrelate? And what strategies do we have to, or do we need, to achieve our set goal? Now let's look at raising godly children. Having and raising godly children may mean different things to different people. To some, the fact that they are called parents, father or mother, is enough. For others, it brings about societal respect and acceptance. And this is pleasing to them. Whilst to some, they see children as a burden. The scriptures in the book of Malachi, however, gives us a picture of the essence of raising godly children and where they belong. Malachi 2.15. And it states, But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. We realize that one of the reasons God brings two people together in marriage is for the purpose of raising godly children, children who look like him and honor him. The goal of producing godly children is for them to reflect his son, Jesus Christ, Therefore, Christian parents should always be conscious of the fact that what the Lord seeks from them 
or from us, our godly children. Genesis 18, 19. One writer, defining broadly the essence of raising children, stated that it is the process of promoting and supporting the physical, emotional, social, and intellectual development of a child from infancy to adulthood. From this definition, it implies that raising children involves training and impacting on the physical characteristics of the child's personality. By this, it touches on how they have to express themselves in words, in their thoughts and their feelings as they develop, invariably touching on their behavior. Again, raising children involves the training and impacting on the social and emotional learning of the child. When this is done if efficiently and effectively, it touches on the personality, academic, and social attributes of the developing child. The third element from the definition is that in raising children, one trains and impacts on the intellectual capacity of the growing child. This affects learning and understanding, thus influencing the child's actions and overall behavior. In all these, we realize two running words, training and impacting, meaning that there is some teaching, guidance, and what I term deposition. Some traits, skills, and knowledge are transferred to the child at the end of the process. Therefore, raising children, and more especially godly children, can be delicate, difficult, demanding, stressful, but at the end, satisfying. It requires commitment and hard work. Again, it takes a lot of time, resources, patience, and love. Therefore, Christian parents should be prepared for this task which the Lord expects of them. On the whole, it is a great blessing to have the opportunity to raise children. In the raising of godly children, two elements dominate, and these are nurturing and training according to God's ways. Nurturing is about training, upbringing, taking care of, protecting, or providing to someone. In all these ways which define nurturing, there is an element of empathy. Alfred Adler, a psychologist, explains empathy as follows. Seeing with the eyes of another, listening with the ears of another, and feeling with the heart of another. This is what we are expected to do in raising children. A report by the Michigan State University in 2013 stated that nurturing is a critical life skill for increasing the health and well-being of children and families. Training, on the other hand, is, a, is more about teaching. These two form an integral part of the whole process, and they are very important. One of the key assignments is that in our nurturing and training, we imprint godly values into the child's life. Unfortunately, our current, in our current dispensation, parents, guardians, and teachers are doing more training than a combination of nurturing and training. Studies have shown that 85% of the influence on a child's life comes from the home. Therefore, one can infer that children will be what their home is. Can we also liken this to the church or the children's ministry? Can we say that a child's Christianity or level of faith will be determined by the state of their Sunday school? This is something for us to reflect on. Reflecting on these issues make one realize the subtle attempt to take the power and influence of the home from the whole process of bringing up children and redirecting it into policies and control by state institutions. This task highlights or brings to bear the importance of the church in developing godly parents with an understanding and appreciation of a godly home and environment and a godly marriage 
for the upbringing of children who know the Lord and also fear God. This is strengthened by the word of God which states, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, verse 6. The type of training being indicated here is one that transcends time and situations. For nurturing and training to be effective in the process of raising godly children, one must leave whatever they teach or transfer to the child, both in word and lifestyle. As the old adage goes, you cannot give what you do not have. Therefore, parents and guardians must model godliness and persist in it. For it is through this that one can cultivate the attributes of godliness in the children. This is because children more often than not model the character of their parents, guardians, and their teachers. We see this strengthened in Paul's communication to Timothy, in the first book of Timothy and also in his letter to the Ephesians, 1 Timothy 4.16. Watch your life and the doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And in Ephesians 5, 1 to 2, it says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Again, we see an example of the raising of godly children in Paul's second communication to Timothy, in 2 Timothy 1.5, where he recollects the upbringing and faith of Timothy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which was first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. By this, Paul is inferring that by the same generational lifestyle of the grandmother and father, same is in Timothy. This is because he believes that a lot of work has gone on in terms of nurturing Timothy in the things of God because it is an imprint of the family. From the trend, it implies that at each stage, they make sure that it is imprinted in your heart, on your mind, and in your actions. Can the same be said about us, about our children, and as a church, about our children's ministry? Now let's look at the child. Generally, children are an outcome of the union between man and woman. In the context of God's word, Children are as a result of God's blessings. Therefore, we see in the book of Genesis, Genesis 1, 28a, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Therefore, we appreciate that children are as a result of God's blessing. God's word also teaches us that children are a heritage from the Lord. It states in Psalm 1 to 27, verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. The word heritage means property, treasure. That is or may be inherited or a special or individual possession. Therefore, the child is a special gift or treasure that God gives to us to care for to nurture as stewards for him. Thus, there is an accountability element for parents and the church on each child God gives to us. We would account for all the children we have in our children's ministry. By the word heritage, it implies that children are not made, but inherited from an original owner, God. Therefore, they must be handled with all the utmost care and value required by all stakeholders who encounter them, the parents, the guardians, the church, and society. However, this must be done on the principles and core values of the giver 
who is God. Children are one of the most valuable members of the family and the church. They form the foundation and base of the family and of the church. They carry the touch and the name of the family and also of the church. For the family, they represent the lineage and carry the image. They build generations. Scripture gives a better appreciation of the importance of children. It states in Psalm 127, verses 4 and 5, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Children are described as arrows. And arrows are potent ammunitions which have been used for generations till now in battles and in the practice of pursuing or tracking animals. However, arrows need to be well fashioned. That is, they need to be designed and worked on and directed to achieve optimum results. And this comes with practice. From the scriptures, it can be inferred that a warrior fights and wins battles. He did, does this with precision and useful tools, like an arrow, which is well designed for purpose. Thus, children form very important elements in achieving the vision 2023 of the church. As arrows, they are very powerful and potent, but they need to be well nurtured and trained to enable them to become the effective and efficient future generations and leaders of the church. This requires focus, patience, and dedication. Raising godly children also brings value to the home and the church. This is because they help sharpen the skills and value systems of the Christian parent or guardian. This effect is in different areas, including the practicing of the Christian faith, expression of love and care, role modeling, prayer, sacrifice, forbearance, commitment, forgiveness, and the list goes on. Now let's look at children possessing the nations. To possess means to have ownership, to occupy in person, to hold or actually have in one's own keeping, to have and to hold. As for to have and to hold, it's a key word of the pastorate because they use it a lot in weddings, to have and to hold. Simply put, it is about ownership, occupation, and influence. Thus, possessing nations, as defined by our chairman, Apostle Eric Nyamiche, is a system where members possess their nations by transforming every worldview, thought, and behavior with values, principles, and lifestyles in the kingdom of God, turning many to Christ. By this, it means the possessor must first have the values, the principles, and the lifestyles of the kingdom. Possessing the nations is a proactive term which requires positive action based on godly principles and values. It is about dominance, it is about influence, and it is about taking possession in every space that one finds himself or herself. The term is also syno very synonymous with the children of Israel in their march to the promised land. The charge was to occupy, to dominate, and to own. However, this is a task that should be done holistically and thus must include the children. To effectively achieve this with the children requires focused and purposeful raising of children in the way and the things of the Lord. This goes beyond normal parenting, but one which has a possessive or battle intent in its approach. Executing it is also the responsibility of every stakeholder, but more especially the parents or guardians and the church. Therefore, 
the need to raise godly children to possess the nation is a clarion call for action both for the transformation of our children and the possession of every space they find themselves. What strategies do we then need to put in place or are required by us to execute this agenda? And I grouped this into two. I looked at the major stakeholders, the parents, and then the church. And so first, I want us to look at the parents. For the parents, I believe that we need to teach and nurture the child in Christ and his word. And it's also fundamental for the church. This is fundamental across board and must be done through the communication of what I term the four W's. That is effectively communicating the word of God. Effectively communicating the worth of God. Effectively communicating the ways of God. And effectively communicating the works of God. For communication to be, to be done effectively so that we can achieve our desired results, it must be done consistently. This means that in our imprinting of the four W's in our children, it must be done purposefully and orderly as indicated in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 28, verse 10. For precepts must be upon precepts, precepts upon precepts, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Amen. It must be done continuously. Similarly, the same must be done without breaks, ensuring that we saturate every opportunity with the words and commands of God as we find in Deuteronomy 6. Seven, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you talk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. The third point under this is that it must be done convincingly. This means that our communication about God and his commands, this means in our communication about God and his commands, sorry, we need to be persuasive as indicated in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32, verse 46. And this requires godly wisdom. He said to them, Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. And my last point under this is that it must be based on personal testimony and experience. Communication of one's personal experience with God is a powerful and practical approach to impacting our children. The most powerful of all personal testimonies and experiences is an impactful life that cannot be explained without God. A person's testimony is an awesome thing, especially when it is backed by a consistent lifestyle. It causes people to listen relate and respond to you if you share your experience. We see this as Moses admonishes the children of Israel to hold dear their experience with God and to also teach them to their children as they move to occupy the new land. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Deuteronomy 4.9 From these, one realized the importance of effectively building the capacities and understanding of parents and guardians with respect to the world, the, time we, the times we live in, and the need of having and spending quality time with their children. This is very essential in the training and nurturing processes process of raising godly children who have the capacity to possess nations. The second major point is explicit obedience to divine instructions. This is important. It is one of the essential elements to seeing God move in the lives of people and nations. We see this in the preparation of the children of Israel to occupy the promised land. Instructions were very critical and obedience to divine instruction 
was instrumental to their possessing and living in the promised land. In the raising of godly children to possess nations, the type of instructions, the mode of communication during the teaching, training, and nurturing, and obedience to these instructions are very important. In the book of Deuteronomy, one observed Moses' directive in this slide. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Deuteronomy 11, 9 to 20. For if you carefully keep all these commandments, which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to hold fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you, and you will dispossess greater and mightier nations than yourselves. Deuteronomy 11, 22 and 23. The third major point is coaching of our children. It is important to expose our children to the realities of the times we live in through training, practice, and living of the word. This should be done by both the parents and the church. This enables the children to acquire skills and knowledge to help build their capacities through the supervision of their parents or teachers. Examples are what we see in many of our churches today, where the children are exposed to evangelism and some major activities of the church. Four is provision of mentorship to our children. Mentoring of the children is very important, and this should be given priority. This is because when effectively and efficiently carried out, it brings about transformation of the children. Parents or guardians should serve as role models and mentors to their children. One thing we must know, we should always know that we are not raising up children. But in actual fact, what we are doing is raising godly adults. Therefore, whatever godly attributes that we desire, we must work at seeing them imprinted in the lives of our children. And my last point is on training, discipline, and admonition. This is fundamental, a fundamental responsibility of every Christian parent, and we see it highlighted in Ephesians uh, 6, 1 to 4. Now let's look at the church. Children grow to become adults. The foundation or base of the present and future church are the children. In this wise, the quality of the members in every adult church will, alert, will to a large extent be reflected by the investment made in the children, especially relating to the things of God. So as we sit here, if we look into the future, whatever you have on your heart and your expectation of how the church should be, will be dependent on the investment you make in the children today. If you want to have a strong church, it's reflected in your investment. If you want to have a weak church, it will also be reflected in your investment. Therefore, churches are supposed to give priority to the focus training of children, especially children who are expected to possess nations. Unfortunately, in many of our churches today, the attention and investment given to the training and nurturing of our children needs much improvement. What should the church then do? The first point, and I'm making some suggestions and recommendations. One is that we need a mindset change. If children have to be part of the possessing the nation agenda, which they are, then there's a need for a mindset change about the children's ministry. This should start first from the pastorate, and then the leadership, then the rest of the adult membership. The second point is that the pastorate and the leadership, and when I say pastorate, please, it includes all my mamas who are here. 
the pastorate and the leadership should not consider the children's ministry as a second-class church. If we have to achieve the vision of possessing nations, then we need to change the way we do things. Our perceptions of the children's ministry must change. It must be seen as an important unit or arm of the church and given the requisite attention and investment. For example, how many pastors here have ministered or stayed throughout the children's service throughout when you consider 2019, which has just passed? How many of us decided that today we are coming to church? We dress up from the home, walk, and come and sit at the children's ministry, start with them, and close from them, and then go home, and then we say that we have gone to church. When you compare this to the number of times we have sat, sat at the adult service, I think the answer, you can provide it better. Quite apart from that, in our churches, we appoint a music director, we appoint a choir uh, director. All they know is about the adult church. They will not even come there and look at the children's ministry choir. It doesn't concern them. The instrumentation, they will even come down. Sometimes you have to go and fight before they will come. But it is one church, and it includes the children. If we have to achieve vision 2023, we need a mindset change, and a drastic one. And those who lead the charge are the people who are here this morning. The third point is that the church needs to provide the environment for the focus training and nurturing of the young ones. The church must be an example of Christian community and love. We are expected to establish community clubs within our vicinities. The question is, how do we effectively do this? It is suggested that the concept of co-creation is adopted so that both the church and the community would own the initiative. Some of the initiatives may involve the creation of Bible reading and study clubs, creation of reading clubs, opportunities for extra classes, academic work, establishment of drama clubs, and in areas where you think you can set up even a course club to bring the children together. That would be very good. These create indirect approaches for the infusion of the gospel and the building of community. The fourth point is that the church must also create an environment for the children to see faith being practiced and for them to also practice the Christian faith. So the church must itself be a good example of practice. Even though the intergenerational service is an excellent idea, the buy-in by all is very important, and all efforts should be done to get everyone to own it and to continuously work at improving on it. You all agree with me, in a lot of our places, when you say you have intergenerational service, the adult members, the numbers drop. A lot consider it as a normal uh, children's week Sunday service because the children are coming and they are going to make noise and disturb us. And if you don't know, the small children also, they also have a mindset. A lot of times when they come to the adult service, they look at you and then we did a survey and they are telling us that they want to go to their church. The point is that we are not receiving them, so they also want to do what? Go to their church. But the term is that it is an intergenerational service. They are the ones to take over from us. So we have to create that environment for them to be welcome. And the leadership has to take the f We believe that it is, it is a process, but it requires leadership to create awareness and the sensitivity within the whole church. Point of, uh, number five, the church must provide the resources, both in terms of finances, logistics, and quality human resource to support the children's ministry in their task of training and nurturing. Building the foundation of the children should be the priority of the church. And these are a few suggested initiatives. We believe that we should have an initiative like one operation, one child, one Bible. In, a, in some of the churches, when you say parents should buy Bibles for the children, it is easy, they will do it. 
But in other places, it is very difficult. Can we as a church, the bigger church, have an operation, one child, one Bible? This is to ensure that each child has a Bible to himself or herself. And reading of the scriptures become part of the growing child. Two, can we also, where you can afford, can you provide some audiovisuals as part of the teaching approaches in the children's ministry? When you go to the adult service, nice, nice things over there. Can we just provide a little for the children's ministry? The third point is that, suggestion is that, can we create children's library within our children's ministry where possible? Our library system is not very strong these days. Can we create children's library? And I'm not talking about building a place. Just a box library. We have a table. We have our box. We have our books. But the church provides books for us. Literature. Christian literature. So that uh, it will create access for, ch for the children to have Christian literature available to them. It will broaden their perspective on the scriptures, and instill a reading culture among our children. Point number six, the church should ensure that Christian, children ministry teachers, sorry, children ministry teachers and volunteers are constantly provided the requisite training and exposure to reflect the new vision and the changing times we live in. Training of teachers should be a shared responsibility of the directorate, the ministry, the area, and the district. Our pastors should be interested in how their teachers are being trained. Apart from training in the word and teaching approaches, it is being suggested that at least every teacher should be trained in leadership, basic principles of leadership, mentorship, coaching, role modeling, and lay counseling. These are some fundamentals that when we teachers have them, it may be helpful. There should also be some basic background checks before someone takes up the position or joins the children's ministry as a teacher or a volunteer. Point number seven. The church must facilitate mentoring and coaching by providing experienced older members, adult members, sorry, as mentors and coaches for the children. There is a need to have champions apart from the parents that the children can look up to. These champions will provide coaching or be an inspiration or motivation to the children. They may also help in ensuring sustainability through the clarification of doctrines, traditions, and practices of the church, etc. They may also help ensure succession through the identification of skills, giftings, talents, and sometimes assist in skills training. Point number eight, the church also needs to provide effective teaching and mentoring on godly marriage and the nurturing of godly children for present-day young parents. This is because most present-day young parents lack the requisite skill and the time in raising godly children who would possess the nations. I'm not talking about parenting. Most of the times, we counsel them and teach them. But what we are doing most is about parenting. Our vision is possessing the nation. And that one, it requires a new type of child, a new type of couple, a new type of system to bring up our children. To support the teachings and trainings provided by the church, the concept of family cells, comprising two to three young families, including an older one to serve as mentor, can be introduced. These cells may meet periodically to interact and share experiences. This may help in strengthening marriages and families and contribute greatly to the raising of godly children with the capacity to possess nations. Then my last point about the church, but I believe that there may be more. Even though better parenting techniques are important, and better programs are also important. The church has a responsibility to provide constant prayer support for the children. This is because the spirit of wisdom and revelation 
in the knowledge of him comes from God. Ephesians 1, 17. To conclude, the times we live in are very challenging for children and the youth. There is a need to build the capacities of the children, both in the knowledge and skill of the faith, to enable them to discern the times and be able to respond to the issues. Invariably, developing a new breed of children with the Joshua and the Daniel character. Children who can possess nations, children who can influence systems and policies, and those whose very presence in a place brings about the fear of God and change to any space they find themselves. To achieve this requires commitment, sacrifice, investment, and leadership from all stakeholders, but more especially the parents and the church. The time to do this is now, and the clarion call by the leadership of the church through the vision 2023 is in the right direction. As we work on this, we must know that we are not merely building our children's ministry. We are actually building our future. And I want to repeat it again. As we work on these, we must know that we are not merely building our children's ministry. For some, they will listen to this and think that we are going to build our children's ministry. In actual fact, I want you to go reflect deeper than this. What we are actually doing is that we are building our future. The Lord grants deeper insights and motivates us to act, even as we reflect on this presentation. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we want to call all Sunday school teachers, right from the directorate, and anybody who has worked with their children before to come forward and give us their song. We want to get the song from the children's ministry. So if you've been a teacher before, or you've been involved in the work of the children's ministry before, we want all of you to come and give us a song. Probably some of you, you are going to uh, renew you know, your interest in teaching the children after listening to such a talk. So let's come together and then give a song. But before the song comes, we want to inform you that Prof uh, used to be or is a former vice chancellor for KNUST. And we thank God. And also a Sunday school teacher. In fact, he has been a Sunday school teacher for so many years. He is still a Sunday school teacher. God richly bless you. Under the canopy, under the canopy, under the canopy of God, my Savior will cover me, give me security. Thank you. 
sing this song again and we are going to enter into a time of prayer. Humble yourself before the Lord He will lift you up Humble yourself before the Lord He will actually wanted to call those of us who have passed through the Sunday school system to come forward and sing. But because of time, I'm not going to do that. I just want you to raise up your hands. We want to know by hands, those of us who have passed through the Sunday school and how God has used the ministry to bless us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I think almost all of us, yes. with the exception of few, who have passed through the Sunday school, and this tells us the importance of the children's ministry. And if that is how important the children's ministry is, and this is how important children are, then we as ministers and as parents, I think the honors lies on us to take this ministry very, very seriously. At this young child, we want to pray after listening to this word. We want God to touch us. We want God to challenge us. First of all, as ministers and also as parents, that we'll be able to nurture and bring up these children in the ways of the Lord so that they will grow and become the people that God wants them to be. Shall we begin to pray? Shall we begin to pray? Loma Santa Raba, Yende Katayanda Raba, Lema Masuto Romo Katayende de Basata, Lama Mama Sayanda, Father, we thank you. The Lord will be able to raise them up in the things of God to honor you and to glorify you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Mandala basu andala bakataya. Le shakataya andala mama mama. In the name of Jesus. Father, we need special grace for this. In Jesus' name. Jesus is my Savior. 
Jesus is my Savior. My my my. Jesus is my 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 my. Jesus is my my. Jesus is my Savior. speaking he posed a question how many times we visited the Sunday school or visited the children in their service for the whole of last year if we are asked to count how many are we going to count and this means that probably many of us are not taking very seriously the work of the children's ministry at this time, we want to raise up our hands and then cry unto God and then tell God to give us an insight, a vision into this wonderful ministry that as ministers of the church, God will cause us to keep an eye on this ministry. Many of us do not know even how the, the, the teachers are trained. We don't know what happens or what goes on when the children meet. But we want to pray. If there is the need for us to repent, let's do so. And ask God to grant us a fresh vision, a fresh understanding. That we will go out there and ensure that this ministry moves on. Because when we look at the children, they form the future of the church. Many of us here pass through the Sunday school ministry. And look at us here. Look at us before the presence of the Lord. And the Lord wants to do more than that. So let's pray. Let's pray. That God will grant us the grace. To take the children's ministry very seriously. And then commit ourselves to the other way. Shall we pray? 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 Father, we continue to pray. We confess before you, O God. Even our inability, the fact that God will not be able to fully get engaged in the children's ministry. We pray for forgiveness and we pray for grace. The Father from here, you enable us in Jesus' name to take this ministry very seriously and do all the things that Father we can do to ensure that the ministry will stand. There are so many things that we can do as major partners of those who train children. We pray in Jesus' name. The Father, you will help us and grant us the grace. In the mighty name of Jesus. Shall we be seated? And we want to call on Prof. Ellis to come and pray for us. Mine, mine, mine. Jesus, Jesus is mine, 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 mine. Jesus, Jesus is mine, Jesus is my Savior, God, we want to thank you this day, Father, for the opportunity, Lord, to think and reflect and also to hear about 
the children who are so precious on today. As a church, O oh God, we come before you. And Father, we have called on today. In the areas where, Lord, we need mercy, we are asking that, Lord, you grant mercy. Father, in areas where we need repentance, Father, we are asking for repentance concerning our work towards the children. In areas, Lord, where we need thanksgiving, we want to say thank you, Lord, for the grace and for the enablement. This morning, Father, we ask that you grant us grace, grant us the enablement, grant us the love, O oh God, for these children. We are praying, O oh God, and I'm lifting, Lord, my daddies and my mommies before you. Father, you know them. You know each and every one of them. And you know the task that is before them concerning the children. I pray, Lord, for your touch this morning. Amen. I pray for your touch this morning. Amen. I pray for your touch this morning. Amen. And Lord, I'm praying, O oh God, that you use us as catalyst, O oh God, to build our children's ministry. And Lord, not to see it as building only the children's ministry, but to see it as a task you have given unto us to build the future of this church. We want to thank you, God, because you are prayer answering God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.